Hey there, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am Shane. I run the events over at 10 Capital Network, and I'm really pleased to welcome our guest today, Jose Luis Silva of DUX Capital, who's going to give you a reverse pitch, uh, and as well as two amazing companies raising, we'll pitch afterward. Um, during the session, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and put those in our chat box. It is unlocked, so we will see everything. And after each pitch, uh, get to a Q&A portion as well. Um, and don't forget to answer the poll at the end of each pitch so we can see uh, what your interest is as well. So with that, I want to welcome Jose and tell us a little bit about yourself and get us started here. Of course. Thank you very much. As always, it's a pleasure to be in in, in your discussions and your panels. Thanks for for all the audience to 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 log in and hear us. So very excited for this. So my name is Jose Luis Silva. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Dux Capital, which is one of the few Latino-led VC in the U.S. investing in Latinos as well. So I'll be pleased to to share some slides on what we do, and also to hear the amazing pitches from the two entrepreneurs that we have today, and and, and provide some feedback and questions from the audience as well. So thank you very much. Let me just share my content over here. Seven years ago, we started the fund when I was coming back from Europe and Asia, coming from my MBA, and from a 10-year experience in investment banking, I joined Daniel, my good friend, since we were seven years old, and in a restaurant in Mexico City, we decided to join forces, and we and the best way to join forces was to create a venture capital fund, because Daniel was coming out from his sixth startup, and I was coming back from all this journey, and and the stars aligned. Uh, most of the times in a VC, you need the founder piece and you need the finance piece in order to create a fund. So we did that, and we decided to name the fund Dux, which means leader in in Latin, and we started off in 2016 structuring our fund and made it happen. We did our first fund in Mexico, and today we are an Austin-based fund. So Dux Capital is a seed fund based in Austin to back U.S. Latinos. As I said, we are one of the few around the, the country investing in Latinos, and uh, we have a, a track record of 17 deals done in fund one. And when we got into this country, we saw two amazing opportunities. One, that we are 19% of the population in the U.S. as Latinos, and less than 2% of capital flows into us. That's a glaring disparity that cannot be ignored. And two, I have not found more than 12 funds doing what we do. Uh, Latinos investing in Latinos with venture capital. Again, uh, overlooking a minority that needs to be addressed. So. Our fund is directed to Latinos entrepreneurs in seed stages. So we did a, a, a first fund back in, in, in 2018 when we did our first investment. We raised $8.4 million uh, in which she was our MVP as a fund manager. We did 17 investments. We invested in nine industries, especially in the tech B2B side and also in the consumer retail group. Uh, we doubled. We have doubled our fund in terms of profit. We have analyzed more than six thousand startups. Actually, to date, it's like six point seven k startups uh, in our in our story. And um, we are grateful to to have thirty LPs in our fund, including the Mexican Development Bank. So our fund has always been institutional since day one. The opportunity that we over, we saw when we started uh, was to direct our efforts to our culture. So we are a, a diverse, emerging, and minority-led fund managers. Uh, the Latinx uh, community in general has been overlooked, especially in the U.S., and we leverage our presence in Austin and in all the U.S. and in Mexico in order to differentiate from funds in the U.S. and also differentiate from funds in Latin America. So we are a very good partner for Latinos because we not only share sometimes the same language, 
but we share the culture, we share the network that it's large in the US and large in Latin America. And with, with that first fund, we, we learned a lot. We made a lot of mistakes as well. We learned from those mistakes. Uh, we did all these investments, which actually 10 were made in the US and seven were made in Latin America. And with all, all that experience and learning, we decided to, as I said, to migrate to Austin. And today we are raising our, our second fund, which is a fund up to $50 million hard, hard cap. We're going to invest in up to 20 portfolio companies. We already did our first investment. Uh, and we always invest in tech-enabled and high-growth startups, as I said, led by Latinos. 100% of our investments are in the U.S., and we invest an average of $1 million in seed and Series A rounds as well. Our team has always been very diverse. Uh, half of us are men, half of us are women. Uh, all of us are Latinos, uh, born in Mexico, most of us, actually. And today, when a, when a startup, uh, when a founder, a Latino founder wants to raise a round, and they, they start searching and looking for investors, uh, gratefully, we are on their top list when, when it comes uh, to venture capital funds in the continent. This is our team. Uh, we are three partners. Daniel and I are the ones in the, in the side. And we uh, ha have the grace of having uh, Susana as our third partner. So uh, the three of us complement each other. And the three of us have been operators, have been founders. Myself, I, I, I used to be an investment banker 10 years. And all of us uh, are working every day to make this happen, together with a group of, of, of 10 people in the, in, in, the, in the fund, and with more than 25 advisors, some of them here, that they have different backgrounds, different knowledge, different networks that help the fund make good decisions, not only in the investments, but also in all the general strategy of the fund. So half of these advisors are investors in the fund, and you can find people from different backgrounds in tech, in CPG, in governments, lawyers, uh, founders, other VCs, other private equity fund managers, that together we have made this dream come true in this eighth year of operations. I would like to close with the, the great opportunity of what we do. As I said, we account for 90% of the population and less than 2% of money flows into us. We contribute around 13% of the GDP in the, in the US. And that disparity is the one that we are attacking with our fund. Uh, because in general, diversity and inclusion drives profits, larger profits. Because when you come to this country as an immigrant, and I've lived with myself in Austin, you have to work harder in order to blend in and to, to try to tap to this market. We are 710 million Latinos across the region. If you uh, put together all, all the U.S. Latinos, we would be the fifth largest economy in the world. So it is a massive opportunity that we are tapping for Latinos to Latinos. I'm very, very happy to, to be here. At the end, uh, why we do this? Because we bring a great talent to our fund, to our portfolio companies, to this country. We bring a lot of manufacturing and supply chain. This is the, the, the example that we bring of nearshoring from especially from Mexico to the U.S. to help our portfolio companies. We are a great uh, platform for e-commerce and retail because we come from those uh, industries. And at the end, we're in the business of scaling and exiting from our portfolio companies. So we have a great network, not only from our investors, LPs in the fund that come from different corporates, different financial institutions, different governments, they become the potential buyers of our portfolio companies. Uh, 
Uh, and, and last but not least, we are very pleased that we have our Anchor LP, which is Bank of America, which actually I'm here in New York, in their annual summit for venture capital. And we are the first venture capital born fund in Mexico invested in the story of the bank. So very happy about that. And every entrepreneur that comes to us, we, we will help them. We, we try to help them not only with our fund, with, but with our partners. As, and as I said, if it's not our money, it's our partner's money as well. And we're here to make a big difference. So that's a, a little intro on what we do. And very happy to, to answer any questions that you may have. Let me just finish out here and stop broadcasting. There we go. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Jose. Uh, if anybody does have questions in the audience, you can go ahead and put those in our chat box and uh, I can ask for you. Um, my first question is, uh, what does your LP base uh, currently look like? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Sure. So a lot of corporates are uh, very interested in VCs, especially with emerging fund managers and with diverse fund managers. And more into managers that are investing also in those underrepresented groups. So we have corporates uh, in Latin America, in the US, big tech companies. We have banks such as Bank of America, as I said, which they invest in, in, in our funds. We have family offices all around the US and also in Latin America and high net worth individuals. Um, the fund is too small for for, for institutional investors, but we're going to get there. So that's the typical LP base that we have. Yeah, that's very exciting. Uh, we did get one question so far. Uh, what business areas or technologies do you focus on? So in general, we invest in industries in which we have knowledge, background, and network. That is typically uh, tech B2B, around fintech, insurtech, legal tech, e-commerce, especially for B2B, uh, robotics, AI. And these are all, are all the industries that we have invested in, in the past. So, And also in consumer packaged goods. So we like food tech, logistics around CPG as well in general. But we receive all types of entrepreneurs and industries. And we try to help them all. Yeah, I guess uh, my follow-up question to that is, so you did mention... Um, you're you're happy to help any entrepreneur. So do you have partners outside of that who can also uh, help if it's not necessarily an area of expertise on your end? Sure. And not only in the area of expertise, but also in the ethnicity. So of course, I, if I only invest in Latinos, my pipeline gets reduced, but I have a hundred, we have 150 partners, VCs and angel investors who will invest not only in Latinos, but will invest in other cultures, in other ethnicities. So we make sure to direct them uh, to, the, to the correct partner. And it is easier for a startup to be introduced by one investor to another investor. So that's why what we do. Yeah, 100%, that makes sense. Uh, we did get another question. Do you have diverse advisors? Do you specialize in Particular companies, I guess these are all different questions. Uh, let's start with, do you have diverse advisors? <laughs> we All of my advisors are diverse in terms of ethnicity, especially in terms of culture and in terms of gender as well. Uh, in, in gender, not all of them, but, all of, but at the end, all of us are Latinos. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, uh, and then another uh, similar question to previous. Um, Mention B two B is that technology restaurants? Do you exclude any business types, uh, etc.? Yeah, I mean, at the end, we're quite agnostic, and we try to to provide those three variables. Well, four Latinos. We know that industry. We have knowledge. We have network. For example, restaurants. We don't have that type of 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 experience, but we do have experience in food tech, for example. So we analyze all of them, and then we try to, to put a target on whether we have that smart money for that specific industry. And, and, and again, we are, we, we are all, all, all the time learning. So that, uh, not knowing an industry doesn't mean that we don't want to get into it. So back, going back to the advisors, 
we constantly bring new advisors to the fund in order to help us to get into a new industry. So uh, please bring everything that, no matter what industry you are, we will help. Gotcha. And then uh, also, do you have any geographic limits? Yes, USA. Yes. All okay. the states in the US. Cool. Um, I had one more question. And again, if anybody in the audience has uh, further questions, please let me know um, and I'll ask them. Uh, but can you give maybe some examples of, you know, maybe some all-star um, portfolio companies you've had? I know uh, I always like to hear about specific portfolio companies and I, I feel like investors love talking about their favorites. So um, maybe not favorites, but some examples. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, one of my favorites are, are is in fintech. So if uh, Mosper, based out of Miami and operating in Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil, they are the well. They were the first fintech for kids in the region. Uh, their largest incumbent is called Greenlight in the U.S. So uh, Mosper started as uh, so the first fintech for kids, or one of the first. And in, in an amazing model in which the allowances that you give to your kids within the platform, you will bank these kids, but at the, at, at the same time, you will give them a financial education. And based, at, based on different incentives, doing your homework, going to karate lessons, uh, uh, not cursing, being a good kid, uh, that allowance would, be, would, would benefit from an interest, uh, financial interest, and, and that way, you incentivize ed education and financial inclusion with kids, and those kids become the next clients of uh, banks and the fintechs. So Mosper is one that excites me a lot. We were the first venture capital to invest in them. After all, they got into Y Combinator, then they got like three or four tier one and tier two funds invested in, in the startup, and very, very glad to, to be one of the early backers of of Mosper, I'm talking about diversity. This is a group of people, founders from Israel, founders from Uruguay, founders from the US, operating in Latin America. So more di diverse than that, it's, 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 it's a good example. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, super cool. We have a few more questions here. Uh, so I'm from Brazil. I moved to Canada with my family six years ago. I have a marketing tech startup, and I would like to know if you invest in startups in Canada like us. Yeah, uh, it, we do need the holding company to operate in the U.S. Uh, and being from Brazil, for us, it's being Latino, so that is checked, that, that box. And sometimes that has happened. So a company operating outside the U.S. is willing to open or flip their companies to a U.S.-based holding company in order for U.S.-based investors to go in to the startup. So the answer is yes. Great. And as I as 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 you always uh, as I always say, everything can be made. It's it's just a matter of two variables: time and money. So you can make things happen. Right, right. Cool. Uh, next question. What is the best way to contact Jose or someone on his team about a legal tech startup in seed stage? Uh, I can actually answer that one. I'm going to release a poll right now. Uh, you can uh, put in your interest there. And if you'd like to follow up, uh, just go ahead and say so. Um, and I'll release that now. And then we will get back to you on that after the event. Uh, last question here. If one of your portfolio companies falters, uh, what do you do? If one of my preferred companies, what? Uh, falters. So falters goes south? Yeah. Means going south? <laughs> so, uh, sorry, I, I've never heard that, that, that word. So, yeah, there's two things. So any institutional investor, and that's a great question. As a founder, you can make this question to a VC. Actually, I encourage everyone to make these questions if you're raising a round. Always ask the VC what is your follow-on strategy? If they don't know what a follow-on strategy is, then it is not a VC. And because VCs should reserve at least 30% of the fund to follow-on investments. So when a startup 
starting to go south. And together you decide that you, you should reinvest because it's a matter of cash flow. It's a matter of timing. It's a matter of macroeconomic situations. But you know that the company can be can go north again. Then the investors should double down and should invest. So the pandemic is a, a, a great example of it. So we reinvested in startups that were going south in the pandemic. Some of them w- went bankrupt, unfortunately, but others went went up. And the good investor in, is the investor that helps you out in the bad times, not in the good times. So it is a very good question. And and sometimes that's not the 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 answer. Sometimes the answer is just leave it to to a write off, unfortunately. And that's a matter of being a fund manager, experienced fund manager of knowing when to reinvest or to let die or pivot. That's another one. So there's a lot of startups that pivot. And if they pivot, you should reinvest as well. Most of the times. Awesome. Well, that uh, comes to the end, brings us to the end of this first portion of our session. Uh, If anybody does have any further questions for Jose, you can put those in our chat box. And Jose, if you don't mind answering those on the side during the rest of the session, uh, that would be great. Uh, But with that, uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Jose. And I'm going to bring up our next presenter, James from Capella Imaging. All right. Uh, Appreciate it, Shane. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to speak a little bit this afternoon on what we're doing here at Capella Imaging. We're a small startup in St. Louis, Missouri, that grew out of uh, one of the the research groups at Washington University Medical School. We're developing a nuclear diagnostic imaging agent that's specific for fibrin associated with blood clots, fibrin. Um, most of the team here has a long history of drug development. And, and so we've got, we're, we're very deep in drug development and cardiology uh, with, with you know anything from R&D all the way to commercial launch. And our lead product is something called Fibrosynth for looking at both acute and the chronic venous and arterial thrombus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So thromboembolism is, uh, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's a growing market. You know, heart disease is, is prevalent uh, all over the world. It's responsible for about 20% of the mortality in the U.S., um, about 900,000 people annually suffer from some form of venous thrombus. Uh, the number of these people that have heart failure um, is growing, and they're, you know, a common treatment for them is some sort of mechanical support, uh, whether that be in the form of ventricular assist devices, mechanical valves, impellers, things like this. Uh, and, and these are very effective tools, but they all share a problem in that they place the patient in elevated risk for thrombosis. Uh, many of these are very difficult to determine, uh, to diagnose, and and the people, you know, the physicians that are tasked with treating and maintaining these patients need better, more effective tools for evaluating the development of thrombosis in these cases, and we think Fibrocent could be the tool for that. So what you see here is an image taken from a, an LVAD pump. A patient came into the Washington University Medical School with symptoms, and so the pump was removed. Uh, for replacement. And this represents what is really the worst case scenario for imaging. This is a very high shear environment, um, very high flow. And what's what's perhaps even more critical is there are high levels, heavy levels of anticoagulants in in the blood system here. And so we take this pump and uh, we put it in a a mock loop system and inject our drug 5% and and we're able to acquire very good images, uh, specifically locating, you know, not only one, is there a great deal of thrombosis in this unit, but we can specifically say where it is and how much. And so this patient was at a very high risk of having a piece of this break away and embolizing away and perhaps causing a a fatal or debilitating stroke, which is still one of the major uh, side effects and complications of of LVAD devices. So we're, we're a preclinical stage company. We're ready to go into the clinic. Um, one of the, you know, the two major things that kill drugs going from preclinical to clinical are toxicity and efficacy. So in the case of efficacy, let's take that. One of our preclinical models is we take pumps that have been removed from patients, as you just saw, 
And, and we go out west here where the dairy industry is pretty big in Missouri. And it turns out male cows aren't very valuable in the dairy industry. So we get them cheap and we implant these, these pumps in these calves and use it as a model system. And, and we acquire images from this system. And so this is really as close as you can get to clinical data in a preclinical model. And so, you know, we've all heard the phrase, you know, we've cured, we've cured cancer in mice many times over. It just doesn't translate to humans. In our case, you know, this has been high, very highly de-risked. In terms of toxicity, it's a nuclear imaging agent. We're dosing an exquisitely small amount of material. So tox is really not a concern. The FDA acknowledges this and only requires a single species of toxicology to, to open an IND. And in fact, we have done a GOP toxicology study and gotten a completely clean bill of health. So it's got a very low cost, low risk path to approval. Let's say it's a growing market. Yeah, you know, it's good news for us, I suppose, as you know, people producing a drug. It's 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 not great news for us as a society, but um, cardiovascular disease is growing. And you know, as I say here, a couple of, of numbers that define the total addressable market. Our initial targets are LVADs and prosthetic valves. Uh, those alone represent an addressable market of about 555 million. Um, we're looking to follow on with that into uh, other things like pulmonary embolism and uh, deep vein thrombosis, DVTs. Now there are pretty good techniques for diagnosing those already, but they're, they're um, subsets of them that are difficult to diagnose where we think we could play a significant role. And what's pivotal about that is once you have your foot in the door and you demonstrate the, the utility and validate this as a tool, you know, for the same cost and time investment, it's very easy to transition to a tool of first choice because if there's the possibility, if there's a 20% chance you're going to have to follow on with fiber ascent anyhow, it suddenly becomes more attractive as a tool of first choice. And these are these are huge markets. So just a couple of key attributes here of things you look for, you know, with with a, with a new drug. You know, how does it perform? Well, you know, we're we're able to very effectively uh, <laughs> we're very effectively imaging, not effectively spelling. I see. Um, uh, various forms of, of cardiovascular thrombus under very challenging conditions where, where the current diagnostic tools are ineffective. We uh, presently, at least a third of these patients get hospitalized at least once a year. Half of that one third will get at least a second hospitalization to treat them for gastrointestinal bleeding because of the anticoagulant. We think we can use this as a tool to, to adjust, to titrate the anticoagulant therapy and prevent that hospital stay which results in you know, the concomitant healthcare cost savings and a greatly increased quality of life. These patients, you know, um, when, you, when you're suffering from GIB, it's, it's, it's not fun and, and the, the follow-up is, is, uh, has a severe impact on your quality of life. Our intellectual property position is very strong. Uh, one of our co-founders, Dr. Alonzo, this was developed in his lab. Washington University owns the intellectual property, but we have the exclusive license for, for manufacturing and selling it. We're looking for a $500,000 investment in the first quarter of 2024 at an $11 million valuation. Uh, that's based on, you know, we, we had a series A round where North Star Medical Radioisotopes put in a million dollars. Uh, that drove all of our preclinical work uh, and got us to the point where we're ready to go into the clinic. Um, comparable exits, I give some examples here, but you know, if you put it into uh, this smart cap table that Steve Apple presented in one of the earlier sessions here at Finn Capital, that, that predicts about a 19-fold return. This is a development team. These, these are the guys I work with daily here at Capella. Um, it's, it's, it's a very good group of people. Myself, Dr. Lanza, uh, Dr. McGee is a, is a, is a very, uh, very good chemist, and, and uh, Grace is, is also a very good radio chemist. These are our medical advisors, and this is just a world-class group of people. Uh, Barry Siegel, Sally Schwartz, they both have a symposia and, and awards named after them at the uh, nuclear Medicine and Medical Imaging Conference. Um, the, these guys are household names in the FDA. Sally Schwartz, in fact, has written the regulatory guidance for experimental INDs. 
Dr. Ewald is the chief of the uh, cardiovascular unit here at the Washington University Medical School and is in charge of all the, uh, the heart failure mechanical circulatory support system. Uh, and the other, other folks here, where uh, Alan Zaharias is going to support us moving into uh, prosthetic valves, and Thomas Schindler is the imaging expert who is behind all of us. He's the one that can, uh, collects the SPECT CT data. And I think, yeah, that's where I was going to stop. I get into some chemistry in the backup slides. And if anybody really wants to see some chemistry, we can do that. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you, James. Uh, Jose, do you have uh, any questions ready on your end? Yes, sure. So, well, congrats on, on, on Capella. And I, I really like the name, uh, Latin name. So uh, <laughs> my question is... <laughs> Have you, have you, how, how has your venture capital path uh, been uh, in terms of fundraising? What are you expecting uh, in, in, in this path? Because as, as, as any particular startup like this one, which dictates a lot of knowledge and a lot of you preparing many, many years, how do you see the, the venture capital space? How, how has been your fundraising uh, in, in, in this story? So, uh, I, I, as I like to say, uh, when it comes to uh, venture capital um, and, and business, I'm, I'm a very good chemist. Um, you know, and, and this, this <laughs> if, if you go back a slide here, you know, the, these are all chemists. And we have, uh, you know, we, we kind of made a mistake in, in thinking, well, we're not looking for a lot of money. This will be easy. And so six months ago, we started thinking, yeah, you know, what the hell? Uh, we have since engaged a, a number of, St. Louis has a very strong uh, biotech startup community, and they've made mentors sure. available to us. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, I've learned a tremendous amount in that six months. And um, so I, I expect, you know, you, you kind of look back and you kind of wish, God, I wish I knew now what I knew that, or knew then what I know now. But, uh, you know, it was all a learning process and got us to where we are today, where we think we have a very compelling story. We, um, you know, the story was always compelling. It's, it's telling it properly and telling it to the right people and speaking the language. You know, I mean, I went to my first VC summit and I came away and I went back to my colleague and said, you're not going to believe this. I was the only guy there showing data. You know, what the hell is the matter with all these people? Well, I, I learned yeah, yeah, yeah. lots to know about data. You know, it's it, sure. it was it was really it was it's been quite a learning experience. And so I think we're at the point now where we've we've got our story tight. Uh, we've got a good deck. We've always had world class people. It's a good product. And, and so uh, I think it's going to come together. That's great. Probably a piece of advice. And that. Uh, um... I'm not saying that you have done it well or, or bad, whatever. So, and this goes to the rest of the founders. Always, if you go through the venture capital path, which is not the only way, always be very aware of the cap table. There's a lot of startups that fail because when they start, they receive very attractive offers of money or capital. Uh, and they sell a lot of the percentage of the company. A rule of thumb is that when a startup raises a Series A, after a Series A, it's when you typically lose control, less than 51% of your company. So a piece of advice is always try to keep your cap table and your, your stock of your company protected as as a dog because that's one of the largest and most common reasons of startups when they come to a venture capital fund and we realize that these founders own 20 percent 30 percent of their company that's an automatic rejection of that startup good to know and and yeah it can go to anyone in this audience yeah, if anybody else in the audience does have questions, you can go ahead and put those in. Um, James, I don't have any myself, so I have heard your pitch uh, a few times and I, I have all my questions answered. So right. um, if anybody does have them in the audience, though, uh, please go ahead and put those in our chat box and James will be answering those on the side. Uh, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll for Capella Imaging. So you can also put your interest in there and we'll follow up with you afterward on that one. 
So that one's been launched. Uh, and with that, I'm going to bring up our final presenter, Michael from Alcanza. Uh, and you can begin whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you, folks, for being here. I appreciate the time that you give towards this. Thank you, uh, José Luis, for your presentation. Very interesting. Um, I'm Michael Hendricks. I am the founder and CEO of Alcanza. As you can say, as you can see, we make immigration easy. Um, and we are providing solutions. Obviously, immigration is a big issue in the U.S. Uh, I, I don't need to go into all the problems. We've all heard them. But if you put a group of people in a room and you ask them to provide a couple words about what they comes to mind when they're thinking about immigration, they're going to say all kinds of stuff. Border wall, border crisis, delays. If people involved directly in it are going to say, you know, expense and government delays and language barriers and so on. So not everybody's going to agree on what the actual problem is, but they're all going to agree that it is a major problem. And so we are working on fixing that problem. We are a vertical SaaS with artificial intelligence. Um, we help attorneys and immigrants directly be able to apply um, for their immigration benefits uh, through the system. It, basically, what TurboTax does for taxes, we do better for immigration because we have uh, AI and other guides that assist through the process. Um, we do provide D2C, which is uh, really the way that we're going to market is a little bit different uh, because we have people that are placed all over the country that are becoming independent contractors. So it's really a B to B to C. Uh, but it, with the D2C, it's a fine fill and file, a super simple process in over 125 languages. We also have a B2B full service uh, SaaS, which allows uh, the law firms to use it. And then we have a uh, enterprise, which means they just use the software, but don't use the rest of the back office. Um, our AI named uh, Legal Efficiency Operator. So by his acronym, he is LEO. Uh, LEO is going through a lot of education right now. Uh, each one of these times that we go through and refine data, very different than what's being done. Otherwise, we have RAG, cash and direct reply. So there's uh, all three of the different kinds of AIs that we're using, uh, but we do epochs to refine that information and to make it um, uh, better visible for people and more accurate. We do have uh, many advantages. Uh, currently, as you can see, there are difficulties. Uh, law firms have to grow in size, human resource size, in order to take on more cases. So by allowing them to have these efficiencies built in and the AI doing a lot of the work directly with the client, it reduces their um, it reduces their load for human resource and increases their efficiencies. On the D2C side, we have the only available easy to use uh, platform. So there's no easy to use informative center online. Uh, and Leo helps provide questions and or answers rather responsive answers generative uh, to allow people to ask questions that they usually have to pay a lot of money to go to an attorney to get. So we're able to reduce um, uh, cost and increased efficiencies um, on that side. So as you can see, this is kind of a review. Uh, we're providing multilingual service that has AI and it's affordable and it allows for there to be a digital platform where the person is in charge of their own case. That's a, a big issue is that communication with attorneys is difficult. They have a lot of cases. This allows the person to be in control of their whole process without having to worry about um, having to get a hold of a legal assistant or an attorney. Um, but it comes with, as you can see, attorney reviews. If you look at the lower part of the left side of this slide, most every package that we offer has an internal attorney review of the packet prior to submission. Of course, we provide other things, document translation, specialized language learning, actually a company out of Mexico that we use called LAM, Latin American Media. They're the ones that created our course uh, for ESL and for naturalization examinations. So our total market just in the U.S., not including all of the countries that want to come in, just in the U.S. is $10.5 billion a year. There are currently over 11 million undocumented people in the U.S., uh, 14 million lawful permanent residents, 9 million of which are eligible for citizenship now. Number one barrier is the language uh, to submit the applications and also to prepare. Uh, as you can see, there's many other processes. Over 1.2 million uh, people get their green card every year, whether it's internally or from the outside in. 25,000 fiance visas. It's a big market there because um, people who are English speakers and American in the US are more used to using technology for these kinds of things. People from outside, especially from Central and South America are a little more skittish about technology, but we're breaking barriers with that. 
over 10 million uh, non-immigrant visas, 2 million labor visas, and that equals about a $10.5 billion spent every year on immigration alone in the U.S., immigration attorneys. Um, for the D2C, uh, B2B beachhead markets, actually this slide's a little outdated. We've actually helped well over 200 customers to date in the beta phase, and we are now moving towards our full function automation. Uh, for D2C, our ideal customer is going to be about 45 or under high school education and 45 plus per year, but under about 120 because the people that have more money are going to be going to attorneys. Um, then you have that that equals about 2.5 million people per year, which is a, a cap of about 1.2 billion in our target uh, original beachhead market. For B2B, we're looking for immigration law firms that are smaller, that need these efficiencies built in more, and then also new entrants into the market. So you can see how those play out as well. So our model, we have what are called local guides. Our local guides are actually people who generally already uh, operate inside the immigrant community in the U.S., Many of these are what are called notarios, people who do immigration paperwork in the gray space, which means that what they do is lawful, but how they're doing it is not licensed. So we're bringing them into the fold and we're getting them a place to be so that they can provide a better service that actually has the backup of an attorney. Uh, it's not a legal offering. It's not a, a legal product, but it is a legal tech where they can get access to that. Um, and so we have various different, I obviously have become <clears throat> one of the names in immigration, social media around the country. Uh, digital mar marketing and social, and then international influencers coming in. Uh, the beginning of 2024, we already have various countries that are just begging to get it, and I have to get the international um, uh, the international trademarking done. And we're looking to hit 30 law firms by the end of the year. So you can see how that breaks down in numbers. Um, it's very easy to see how those things accumulate. That's 500,000 per month just on the local guides, and that's only with 100 of them doing five five cases a month. Um, so that's a very limited, it's a very conservative number, and we already have local guides that have onboarded and they're already processing through. Um, so we're seeing really good returns on that, and we're working on getting the B2B up so that we can start the potential future government contracts. Of course, we all know that there's, there's great delays. If anybody's ever tried to get a, a labor visa for someone, we know that it can take years. Even a kid that's 21 USC petitioning a parent could take nine to 18 months. Why? No one can figure it out. USCIS only says it's because they don't have enough human resource. And my answer is, why do you need humans when a, when a system can provide uh, the system? So we would hope to contract with the U.S. government in order to be able to process these. Very similar to how LATOS does for, um, or LATOS does for the IRS. So these are some of the product offerings inside. It, it is a vertical, so it's a deep-rooted, high-level vertical. And these are the different things that are inside the different product offerings inside the system. Our revenue model is tracking on projected. Uh, so what we're doing right now is we're actually starting to scale with the automation fully complete. I've kind of throttled on purpose so that we can make sure that we're not overwhelming a human resource need. And so then we're able to, as we, as we get the full automation, we can scale much more easily. And that's actually coming online here in the next week or so. Um, so obviously that we have some competitors, neither one of them actually offer uh, anything that's directly in this space. None of them have artificial intelligence, none of them have a na native app, and none of them, none of them I'm sorry, are uh, immediate gratification. In other words, it's the, the fill and file. Uh, there is no API, so there's no direct electronic file. You still have to do a lot of it via paperwork, but at least that person will have it available to either print it out or go in with their local guide, sign and submit. Um, so they're not really our competitors, but yet I have to put something up there. So these are some of the ways that we differ from them. Obviously, we have um, the, the, the full package that we're offering. Um, and so there are good exit strategies. Uh, of course, having a, a high level company that's bringing in that much, uh, you have to have a big monster company that comes in into it would look into play in that. They've already done some uh, acquisitions of Mint, MailChimp and uh, credit karma. So, so it's a lot of this administrative stuff and they're already working in the tax field. So that's something that they already have that's administrative also. And then Lido's already mentioned them. They already work with the, the uh, government IRS doing a lot of the processing of tax forms, which I don't know if any of you saw, but recently the IRS is now beta testing um, electronic or digital filing. So in several, I think nine states around the country. So they're really trying to work. Now the IRS and DHS are very different. So the Department of the Treasury 
wants your money. So they're going to do everything they can do to give you easy access. With immigration, since it's a benefit and not a right, they're a little less keen. So we're hoping to come in and swoop in and be able to take that over. Um, our team is built up pretty well. I've been an immigration attorney for years. I've had uh, multiple startups and exits previously. Um, the other person is my brother. He's actually the lead for Latin American Media, which is the organization that created, and he's operating as our fractional CEO, our COO, I'm sorry. Uh, we have Lily Wolfbrandt, who's been working with me for over 10 years in the legal space, and so she's our, one of our guide trainers. Robbie, which is our senior sales, will be moving into the COO position here in the next month. And then we have our geniuses on the backside for tech, which is uh, Nathan been coding for over 20 years, is actually the, the infrastructure builder of our system uh, and the, um, the coder. And then Michael Maestas that works alongside him. So the ask right now is actually uh, $500,000 on preferred stock uh, investment. And it actually is a $5 million post money valuation. So I wanted to make sure that was very clear. Um, we had a $4 million previously, we were looking at a safe note, but I've converted that to a preferred stock purchase. I already have 50,000 um, committed and another 50,000 from the same uh, uh, private investor out of California who is wanting to get even deeper in. But we don't have a lead investor in the form of a VC or an angel. So uh, that's what we're looking for. And obviously this stuff will go to improving software, uh, marketing strategies, native app development, and so on. So the money is being used for things that will advance. Uh, we are looking to see for 2024, right now this year, we're looking to target about a quarter million in the beta stage to the end of the year. And the next year looking to increase that to over 5 million. The following year, 30 million. And then the following year, 120. And those are relatively conservative numbers. Any questions? Thank you, Michael. Uh, yes. yeah, let Jose start us off. Again, if anyone in the audience has questions, you can put those in our chat box as well. Yeah, thank you and congrats. I, I personally have lived this uh, many times and it is a pain. And I have some points, different points. So as you know, as an attorney, you said that your technology will, especially in, in the D2C, direct to consumer, I would use this technology to file under my persona and myself. So as you may know, some governments uh, of, migra of migration, if, it, if, if the file comes from an attorney, it would be easier and faster to process that visa. Rather than if you filed as a person, it's more time and more difficult. So how do you cope with this? I mean, I think that the end game and the winner of this industry, and you said it, will be the one that connects the government in order to reduce times from, from, from their processors. You know, they are overwhelmed uh, with all the applications that come from outside the US. So if you file as a person versus filing as a, an attorney, how will you resolve that variable? Okay, so thank you, Jose. That's that's an awesome question. So there are two major issues there. Number one, it's not actually looked any differently by the government. They don't care if it comes from an attorney or a person. The reason that there are delays is because the person doesn't know how to file properly. Um, so what ends up happening is the government finds issues, and the government is actually very magnanimous when it comes to this because they give the person opportunity to fix whatever they've done incorrectly or not, or supplement the record with things that they have not submitted um, properly. So that reduces it because these guides internally and the attorney review helps nix that completely. And I didn't mention it, but yeah, if we can have, so what we're doing is we contract with the government, there'll be a customer facing side of the, of the, the system, the platform and a government facing, and it'll be, it'll be cut between by a semi-permeable barrier. So that means there's no lag, there's no data loss, there's no requirements for um, people to submit other physical documents because everything will be uploaded. Now that's a that's a process that is ongoing and I'm hoping that by 26, 27, we can get our foot in the door well enough to actually, because there's no RFP out for this. There's no government agent. They're not asking for it yet, but they are asking for solutions and they don't have any. So we want to provide them a solution on a silver platter that says, hey, look no further. This is it. We got you. And I built it painstakingly because 
I want it to be easy. I want it to be fast and I want it to be affordable. And I think when we complete those three things, it'll be a no brainer, um, especially with the artificial intelligence built in that will allow for people yeah. to obtain information and knowledge that is equal to what comes out of my brain because it is my brain um, and allows them to get the answers they need much more quickly and much more cost effectively. Great. Probably a, a very fast follow up on that. And, and, and you don't have to respond because I think we're out of time, but I would, you're the expert here, but in the direct to consumer model, you have a natural churn. I, I suspect that because if I contract your SaaS and I get my visa, when I get my visa, I'm no longer your client. Probably in the renovation of that visa five years after or four years after. So rather than the, the B2B in which you have, if you have the government and you have all those law firms and, and, and you have an effective model, they will rely on you and, and they will never churn. So I would analyze the direct to consumer piece. And do you mind if I answer? Yeah, uh, if yeah. you want to give a short answer, that'd be. Okay. Um, so, so there are a lot of systems that provide some level of uh, efficient operation inside technology for law firms. That's my problem because the law firms become the gatekeepers. So yeah, it makes sense to be for like this permanency. Of course, we have solutions for that. Like we're going to offer a vault where people will have a monthly subscription to maintain and retain their, their documents and to keep them. They'll be able to upload other documents. How many times have we heard about someone losing their birth certificate? My house burned down. I don't have my green card, my naturalization certificate. So maybe you guys have it, but I hear it all the time. And so what it does, this allows them to keep that stuff secure. So we have the vault, but we have follow on processes that help like English language learning, document translation. So the lifetime value increases significantly. And you having been through this, you know that immigration is not one process. It is many processes over many years. And so then you have that person and then you have the family member and no one's offering this to consumers since the gatekeeper is the attorney, the, the attorney charges whatever he wants. And so the, the consumer never ends up getting the benefit. And it's not completely altruistic because if I can bridge that gap between the technology and the consumer directly, I am bridging it. And as I bridge it, it's a much larger volume uh, than anything I could do directly with law firms. Very clear. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you uh, for your presentation, Michael. And again, thank you, Jose, for joining us today and for your presentation and all the feedback as well um, on our two companies here. Um, with that, we're going to close things out. I did release a poll for Alcanza. So if you're interested in the audience, please go ahead and put your um, interest in that poll. I want to thank you all as well for joining us. It was a great session today. We will be following up with everybody after the event. Uh, the recording if you missed something or if you just want to go back and look at the pitches um, as well as some other information. So uh, with that, we're going to close the session out. Thank you again, Jose, uh, James, Michael, and all of our audience members. See you next Thank time. Thank you. Guys. Have a great day. Thanks for organizing. Bye. Bye, guys.